Welcome to lecture 6.1, where we are going to be answering the question today, what is a document? So in this video, we're going to give some historical context around documents, starting with XML and the rise of object-oriented programming and how we eventually moved into a, a slightly different file format that we're going to be talking about in this course called JavaScript Object Notation or JSON. And once we get through that, we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into JSON because understanding JSON is critical to understanding how to interact with MongoDB. So very important that you take some time to really absorb this content. If you understand the structure of JSON objects, it's going to help you understand how to interact with MongoDB in a much better way. Now, why documents? Why do we use documents at all? And since the beginning of computing, we have always struggled with how to transfer data between computers. And we call this process ETL, or Extract, Transform, and Load. And it seems at its face like this would be a relatively easy thing. We have data on one computer, we just want to load that into another computer. But we wind up with all of these issues around how different computers, different operating systems, different applications, different business problems might all need data to be in slightly different formats, right? Different file formats, different file systems, different character encodings. Uh, it used to be the case that it was very difficult to transfer a file from a, an Apple computer over to a Windows PC. Right? And in recent years, that has become a little bit easier, but across all types of computers in the enterprise, uh, we run into all kinds of problems where files aren't compatible between systems, or it's just difficult to get data out of one system and into another. Now, with the advent of databases, and in particular non-relational databases, there are other issues that arrive described in the CAP theorem around do we prefer consistency or availability or partition tolerance, all types of other things to consider. And we also talk about issues around data integrity and standards and the flexibility of using our data. So what seems to be a very simple prospect of just getting data from one system to another winds up being pretty complex. And so documents are one way that we are able to reduce this complexity a little bit. Now, like many things we discuss in this class, the history goes back to the uh, 90s when we started seeing the rise of the internet and the rise of e-commerce. And during this time, uh, one of the biggest technologies was HTML or hypertext markup language. And that looks something like this, where you have a document, and in that document, you have encoded both the formatting and the style of the document and the content of the document, right? So we start at the top by saying this is an HTML document. Uh, we might have some information describing the, the header and what's in the document. And then we have a section called body, and inside the body is our actual content, and we can apply tags that describe things like the size of the font and the color of the font and the layout of paragraphs and where we have images and where we have things like hyperlinks, right? And this is a very effective way for transmitting these documents because this is just a text document that can be interpreted by any computer, any operating system, right? As long as your browser knows how to interpret HTML code. However, it turns out that combining the content and the formatting into one document is a pretty bad idea. Because what if you want to take this content and then present it in some other format? Right? If you're an e-commerce store, maybe you want to have all of your content describing the name of a product and the price of a product and the description of a product. And you want that to look one way on the page where you're displaying like all of your products. And then when someone clicks on a particular product, you want to change the formatting to look differently. And then when they put that product in their cart, you might want to change the formatting again. When you have all of your content and formatting uh, kind of mixed together in one HTML file, it becomes quite difficult to do that. So we saw in the late 90s and early 2000s the advent of a technology called cascading style sheets, which were used in conjunction with HTML, uh, where the CSS dictated the formatting, and then the actual content was all captured in an XML, XML or extensible markup language file. 
So this combination of CSS, XML, and HTML really made our web content a lot more flexible and a lot more usable. And XML was so usable that this question kind of starts to arise, well, can XML serve a greater purpose than just uh, than just describing the data that's on a web page. Over the last two decades, we have seen XML become extremely widely used for both transmitting and storing data. It's uh, designed to be very simple and flexible and generalizable. It's platform independent, so XML can be interpreted by a Windows machine or an Apple machine or a Linux or Unix machine or a mainframe all equally easily. It's just a, a plain text file, it's relatively easy to read and write. Um, and in fact, in the early 2000s, there was a, a, a lot of thinking around the idea that XML was going to become just the de facto universal file format, uh, especially for anything you were going to try to transfer out of an application or outside of your organization, because you could really cater an XML file to capture anything at all. It's really, really a great technology. And in fact, here's a fun thing you can try. Uh, with any modern Microsoft Office document, so any, any document that ends with an X, like the DOCX Word file or the PPTX PowerPoint file, uh, that file is actually just a zip file that contains a collection of XML files. So if you take a, take a Word document, and I would suggest using uh, making a copy of a document so you don't accidentally corrupt something, but if you take that document and rename it to have a file extension of zip, Z-I-P, you can open that up and actually see all the XML files that make up your uh, Microsoft Office files. So kind of a cool thing to uh, look at there to see how widely used XML really is. Now, did XML reach the level of prominence that a lot of people thought it would 20 years ago? Well, yes and no. XML is very, very widely used uh, for both data storage, data transmission. You see it a lot uh, where you store configuration information for, uh, for applications. So it is very widely used. However, as web applications became more and more prevalent and there was a need to be able to rapidly transfer data between uh, web browsers and server applications, there were some weaknesses in XML that began to emerge. Uh, for one thing, it is a very verbose uh, markup language and can be a little bit clunky uh, for applications to interpret. So in the early 2000s, there was a new technology emerge called JavaScript Object Notation or JSON. And JSON was really focused on having this fast transmission of data between uh, clients and applications in, in order to facilitate this stateless real-time server browser communication. So let's take a moment now and just look at what an XML document and a JSON document look like. Here is a sample XML document that contains data about a student. And one very important thing about XML is that each element in your data set has an opening tag and a closing tag. So you see we open the student element here and then we close the student element down here and then everything between the opening tag and the closing tag are other elements that make up this student. Okay, so we, for example, have name. So we have an opening tag for name and a closing tag for name. And everything between the opening tag and the closing tag is the value that makes up name. Okay, same thing for classification, for number of hours that have been completed. And then for address, see we have our opening address tag here and our closing address tag here. And then inside the address element, we have a number of sub elements like street, city, state, and zip. So these are all elements that together make up this larger element of address. And we can nest any number of sub elements to describe uh, the address or, or any other element within our XML document. So now let's take a look at what this looks like in a JSON format. Now, in JSON, everything is represented as an object, and objects are enclosed in these curly braces. So we have uh, the curly brace here to indicate that we're starting this student object, 
And within the student object, we have all of these attributes that make up a student, okay? So just like in our XML file, we have a name, classification, hours, and address. And notice that the elements of address are also wrapped in curly braces. So address is actually an object. And this object for address is made up of these attributes, street, city, state, and zip. So we're capturing the exact same thing we just had in our XML file. We're just doing it in a slightly different way. So now let's look at these side by side. Here we have our JSON document on the left and our XML document on the right. And one of the things you'll probably notice just right off the bat is that the JSON document is a bit more concise. Uh, in this case, about 152 characters uh, compared to 221 in the XML document. So there's just simply less stuff that we have to store and uh, transfer over the network in our JSON as opposed to XML. JSON also allows for arrays of data, which we're going to be seeing in uh, just a moment, whereas XML does not. And the JSON format is just simply better suited to object-oriented programming. It's easier for an object-oriented programming language to parse JSON than it is XML, which is why we often see JSON used in these types of applications. So now we're going to move on from talking about XML and we're really going to focus on JSON and understand what makes up a JSON object. JSON objects are made up of collections of names or I'm going to call them attributes and values. All of the attributes in our JSON object are going to be one of six data types, a number, and it doesn't matter if it's an integer or a floating point, a string, which we're going to have wrapped in quotation marks, it can be a Boolean attribute, which is going to have just a value of either true or false. We can have attributes that are arrays of attributes, and we have those values wrapped in square braces. So this first example here is an array of numbers, or we can have an array of strings. An attribute can also be an object, right? So an object can have sub objects as part of it, or an attribute can just be uh, can just have a null value. And this last point here that JSON objects can contain other JSON objects or objects can be nested within other objects is one of the things that makes this so very powerful. So let's take a look at what a JSON document really looks like. So here we have a JSON object that looks like it's probably describing a customer. Uh, this object has an attribute of name, which is a string. We can tell because it's wrapped in the quotation marks. We have an age, which is a number. We can tell because it's not wrapped in quotation marks. Has an attribute called married, which is a Boolean. It's going to have a value of either true or false. We have an attribute called children, which is an array of strings. And note that it's wrapped in these square braces. And then we have an attribute called accounts, which is an object, okay? And the accounts object is made up of two other attributes, checking and savings, which both appear to be numbers. Now let's think about this a little bit differently. We might actually want to store something like uh, information or data about our children in a different format than just having them as an array of names we might want to make children an object. And then in children, we have two attributes called daughters and sons, which are an array of strings. And now at this point, we can query our object and ask all kinds of questions like, give me the, val all, the value of all of the attributes for a customer, or we can query for just a single attribute like customer.name, or customer.children, which will tell us the names of all of the children. Or we can dig a little bit deeper and say, give me the value of customer.children.daughters, and that's going to give us just these values here. And note that every document in our collection can have a different set of attributes. So not every customer may have this children attribute, or they may not have a children.daughters attribute or they may have some additional attributes. Okay, so this is just kind of getting back to the flexibility of our non-relational databases. Not every document in our document database needs to have the same set of attributes. 
I have a short story here that I'd like for us to take a moment and read, and then I'm going to ask that you pause the video and think for just a moment about how you would create a JSON document to capture these requirements. So imagine you're developing a system for a veterinarian hospital, and the vet has human customers that have a name and a phone number, and then customers may have one or more pets that have a name, a type of animal that they are, and then optionally, we're going to record the weight. Okay, so think just a moment and maybe look back at the other slides, the format of our JSON document, and let's think about how we would capture these requirements. So go ahead and pause the video, take just a minute or so, think about this, and then come back and we'll work through it. All right, so here is one approach. We might have an object called customer that has attributes of name and phone number, and then uh, attributes of pet name, pet type, and pet weight, right? So we have Fido, he's a dog, and he's 35 pounds. Now, I don't think this does a really great job of capturing the requirements because every customer can have one or more pets, right? And since in JSON, we can have objects that are sub objects of other objects, we can do a much better job here. And to do that, this is, uh, this is what I would propose, that we have our customer object that has attributes of name and phone, and these are both string attributes, and then an attribute called something like pets, which is an object attribute, and the value of pets is another object which describes a pet, and it has attributes of name, type and weight, okay? And if we have multiple pets, then this pets attribute could be an array of objects. And to indicate that, we would just wrap all of these pet objects in square braces. So we have a name, phone, pets, and inside pets, we have these three objects for Fido, Shasta, and Nemo. And there are different types of pets. Note that not all of our pets have a weight, right? All of our objects within our JSON object can have a different set of attributes. So we have a lot of flexibility that MongoDB is going to be able to take advantage of, and we're going to be seeing that demonstrated over the next several videos, so let's get started.